Okay. So uh, for today, uh, we'll be going through what we refer to as pre-incident planning. Eh? Uh, for, for us all, we know that uh, pre-incident planning helps your department to make better command decisions because important information is assembled before the emergency occurs. Okay, so uh, with pre-incident planning, it helps us to, in the process of obtaining information about a building or properly and storing the information in an accessible system. So with that, we'll be able to tackle any kind of fire, any kind of incident before it occurs. So uh, with that, I would like to recall or take us back to one of the major firefighters who had the experience in the field, uh, who's known as the late Francis Branigan. Uh, Francis Branigan says, the building is your enemy. Uh, know your enemy. The building is your enemy, know your enemy. With that regard, I will say, I'm able to see my enemy before it dons its armor. So with that, I'm saying, or I'm talking about a building. Before any construction usually takes place, then we as firefighters, we have the mandate or we are required to visit the facility and ensure that we are giving them the best. So with that, we'll be able to see the nakedness of that facility. When you see the nakedness of a facility or a building, with this, I'm saying that you can be able to see the type of roof before the roof concludes. You can be able to see the type of wall and which type of wall, where are the spaces in between before it puts on with a cover, right? So with a cover, you will not be able to undress a person, perhaps if you did not see him, how he or she was before he dressed. So with that, when we're talking of pre-incident planning, we're saying that it helps us to attain our goals. With that, we're talking of ge geographic information systems. Our geographic, how does it look? How is it around? So that we do not just go into any fire activity. So I would like to recall it with one of perhaps uh, a fire that occurred, right? Here in Kenya, back then in 20, 2017. In 2017, uh, we had a fire that, uh, we had a fire back then at uh, one of our companies that produces paint. Oh, it went down all of this. Not knowing that no one was there to rescue them, but perhaps everyone who was around did not knew or did not have the idea of what really pre-incident planning is. When you're talking of pre-incident planning, pre-incident planning is very different very very different from when we're talking of the process or information of acquiring or pre-incident survey with the pre-incident planning you are saying the chances of a fire taking place it's there the chances of a fire taking place exist so we are planning so that if it happens a fire takes place we will be there to encounter and enhance what we really need. The use of modern information technology has greatly enhanced the ability of fire departments to capture, store, and likely we also say uh, the ability of fire departments to capture, store, organize, update, and retrieve the incident plan. In this case, what am I really saying? Accurate and current information such as drawings, maps, satellites, and aerial imagery, photographs, descriptive text, list of hazardous materials, and material safety data sheets can be made available instantly to the firefighters who need it during an emergency incident. Here in Kenya, a pre incident plan may not really be the case but what if we do a pre-visit to any site after the construction has been done of which is not also 
what I'm advocating for. Today I'm advocating that we visit the building before it wears its dresses. And that I will signify or I will direct the point from Francis Branigan, one of the firefighters, who is the late Francis Branigan, who said, the building is your enemy. Know your enemy. How do you want to know your enemy? You want to know your enemy from the structure. And when you're talking of structures, you're talking of the types of building construction. So what are some of the building constructions that we have around us? We have like five building construction. One, fire resistive construction. Two, non-combustible construction, non-combustibles. Three, ordinary combustibles. Four, heavy timber. And five, wood frame. Those are some of the five constructions or types of buildings that we will encounter when dealing with a day in, day out, daily activity of fighting fight. Remember, the fires will not only last on the buildings. They may be different. This type of building, they may be different. It will not only be a home, okay? It may not only be a home, but we may have classifications of building. And the classifications of buildings that we do attend to, then we have like three. Major uses of classification, one is public assembly. When you're talking of public assembly, where are we going to tackle this fire? Public assembly examples are theaters, auditoriums, churches, arenas and stadiums, convention centers and meeting halls, bars and restaurants. Of late, we have been seeing fires occurring into this, some of these buildings and public assembly that I will recall to you that happened back then in 2015 was Nak Nakumat downtown perhaps happened back then in 2009-2010. It was a public assembly. And if we as firefighters had pre-visit this building, then by now we will be having something that is greater out of the outcome that was there at long last. Secondly, major use in classifications of buildings, we talk of institutional, institutional buildings, such as hospitals and nursing homes and schools. When going to schools, then there is specific moments that we check to. Is it during the day? Is it evening? Or is it at night? If it's during the day, then we expect students to be there if it's not a weekend, right? If it's during at night, we expect students to be there if it's a boarding school, okay? Then hospitals. When you go into hospitals, then hospitals were built in different considerations. Hospitals were built in different considerations. In this per se, I will talk of occupancy considerations, healthcare facilities. Healthcare facilities such as hospitals, nursing homes, assisted living facilities, surgery centers, and ambulatory healthcare centers require special pre-incident planning. Hospitals are often very large and include many different areas, ranging from operating rooms to walk-in clinics, the most challenging problem in emergency incident healthcare facility is protecting non-ambulatory patients. What am I meaning by non-ambulatory patients? These are some of the patients who, can, who need to be assisted to walk in case a fire has taken place. Then what do we really need to do at that moment? A defense in place philosophy is used when designing fire protection for these facilities. This approach presumes that patients will not be able to escape from a fire without assistance and that 
there may be no, there may be enough staff present to move all of the patients. Therefore, the facility itself is designed to protect the patient from the fire, and most healthcare facilities utilize fire resistant, fire resistance construction. So you will see when we go to back to our types of building and construction, we'll talk of type one, fire resisting. Okay, not any other type of building, but a fire resisting type of building that is built as a healthcare facility. Have fire detection systems and sprinkler systems and are compartmentalized. What do I mean by compartmentalized? They are joined together. One does not work on itself, but they are a compact. In this case, if it becomes necessary to move patients from a dangerous area, the preferred approach is often horizontal evacuation. What do I mean by horizontal evacuation? Moving patients from a dangerous area to a safe area on the same floor. So we do not like literally move all the patients outside that building, but we move the patient from the zone that is dangerous to the zone that is safe within the same floor as we continue tackling the fire. It is much easier to wheel a bed to another area on the same floor level than to carry patients down stairways. Remember this. When you're talking of this type major use and classifications in pre-incident planning, a good pre-incident planner will always ensure that he does his pre-visit and he makes sure that his and her colleagues, before they ever go to any fire, they do a, top, a tabletop discussion. What do I mean by a tabletop discussion? They outline the building on the table. People bring in their views and they are able to see what really needs to be done, where and when. A good pre-incident planner will have underlined that we have exits. How many exits do you have in such a building? There may be four, there may be five, of which these exits are fire exits. Remember, when you're talking of exits in terms of fire departments, we have three categories. That is primary, secondary, and tertiary. And when you are doing a tabletop planning pre-incident plan of a building, we'll be able to analyze them, outline them, and arrange them accordingly to what would fit for us, we as firefighters. But more so, here in Kenya, what we need to underline and pinpoint as per se is that pre incident planning is all about mental factors on building and construction of a certain public assembly, institutional, or commercial. Remember that each and every firefighter, let me outline the necessity or the real thing when we are tackling fire, perhaps back here in our country. We say that, <clears throat> let us know what type of fire are we going to deal with. And when knowing the type of fire that we are going to deal with, let us know what to wear and when to wear. With that, we will be able to go to fire and go back home safely. 
as regard to that, you may see that most of our fire departments around our country and our continent at large as Africa, when we respond to fires, we only have what we call the motive, our passion that drives us to go and assist the others. But where is our safety? When helping, help yourself first so that you can be able to help the other. And in regard to this, I say that safety comes first and safety is paramount. Safety comes first and safety is paramount. With that, before you leave your facility, before you leave your fire department, ensure that back in that engine of yours, you have done properly PPE. That is your protective, personal protective equipment from the boots to the helmet. And in case we are going to go into any building, then we have our BAs with us breathing apparatus ready for us to go in and assist where necessary. When you arrive at the target hazard, before you go down on that fire engine of yours, I say that most fire departments are not able to create pre-incident plan for every individual property in their jurisdiction. Instead, they identify properties that are particularly large or that present unusual risks. These properties are identified as target, target hazards and target hazard properties pose an increased risk to fire fighters. With that, I talk of the term known as conflagration. You may want to write it down, eh? Conflagration. When I talk of conflagration, I'm simply meaning a large fire involving multiple structures. A large fire involving multiple structures. Properties that have increased life safety hazard include the following structures. One, hospitals. Two, nursing facilities. Three, assisted living facilities. Four, large apartment buildings. Five, hotels and rooming houses. Six, schools. Seven, public assembly occupancies. So the term conflagration is a large fire involving multiple structures, right? So with such a term, and knowing such structures may burn, then that's where we come and start developing a pre-incident plan. Remember that the information that is gathered into a pre-incident plan is gathered during a pre-incident survey. The survey is usually completed by one of the crews that will respond to an emergency incident at the location its performance enables the crew to visit the property and become familiar with the location as they collect the pre-incident information. Survey information can be collected and updated automatically in real time through mobile devices. Okay, with this, I would like to outline 
the typical targeted hazard property. Typical targeted hazard properties. One, bulk oil facilities and refinery. Here in Kenya, you may talk of KPL, Kenya Premier, Kenya Pipeline Company. High rise building, like the one we had back then in 1998, bomb blast. Hospitals, one of our national hospitals here in Kenya, that is Kenyatta National Hospital. Hotels and rooming houses. Kempiski may be an example of one of the hotels. Large apartment buildings that exist. Where I stay, we have a large apartment building. Lumbayad. Lumbayad, how is it created with board, right? Manufacturing plants. One of the manufacturing plants in Thikas, some years back, also was burning. And our firefighters managed to go and put off the fire. Nursing home and assisted living facilities. These are home for the old, home for the elderly, home for people who cannot do much, like an hospice public assembly occupancies, public assembly occupants, where we can gather and enjoy. But a fire may strike in that, then we need to know or to have a pre-incident plan of such allocation, of such allocation. Schools. When you're talking of schools, remember we're talking of primary, secondary, universities, colleges. All of these, they may be strike with a fire at a certain moment. And per se here back in Kenya, our country, I will say that we have had so many fires that occurs into these schools of ours. But how do we prepare ourselves, we as firefighters, so that when we go into those institution or into any of the institution we have the correct information and we know where we are going to park remember that a pre-incident planning involves you as a firefighter knowing that you are able to plan and know where to park know where to get the water from the water source know what is going on what is burning of which if you had done a proper pre-incident plan it will have enabled us when we respond to any incident in and around our country or any countries that you are then you know that you will not be leaving the facility because the facility has got its own hydrant okay you know the facility has it got its own security that they will be able to provide to you guys. Another typical target hazard property is a shopping center. Shopping center. Remember when you attacked back in 2015, one of our shopping center? It may have looked like a terrorist attack. But at the end, a fire struck out. How did firefighters deal with it? Who were there? An activity is taking place on top of another one. Mm -hmm. And in this case, it was a large fire involving multiple structures. Conflagration. We cannot outdo it. Last but not least, in the typical target hazard properties, we talk of warehouses, where we store before they are dispatched to different facilities. Where do we really store this equipment? And with this, I would like to give our firefighters some safety tips. And one of the safety tips that today I would like to outline is that pre-incident planning is not the same thing as fire prevention with fire prevention. 
with this, I'm saying that with fire prevention, the goal is to identify hazards and minimize or correct them so that the fires do not occur or have limited consequences. I repeat, with fire prevention, the goal is to identify hazards and minimize or correct them so that fires do not occur or have limited consequences. While with pre-incident planning, the person creating the plan assumes the person creating the plan assumes that a fire will occur and compiles information that responding firefighters would need. Pre a pre-incident survey can often identify the need for a pre-incident plan or a fire pre prevention inspection. For this, reason many departments conduct pre-incident surveys simultaneously with fire safety inspection i'm sensitizing on this that whenever we are going to do a fire inspection let us also do a pre-incident plan not the kind of roof that is over your head. Know the, know the type of wall that is on your right, your left, your back, or your front when you're walking in that building. Is it a fire resistant? Is it non combustible? Is it ordinary? Is it heavy timber? or it's just another wood thing. For this reason, many departments conduct surveys simultaneously with fire safety inspection. And if this method is used, different members of the department should be assigned to conduct the inspection and to complete the pre-incident survey. And in this separation of duties allows each firefighter allows each firefighter to concentrate on the objectives of one specific assignment. Allows each firefighter to concentrate on the specific objectives of one assignment. Remember that, Conducting a pre-incident survey should be conducted with knowledge and cooperation of the property owner or occupant. Don't just pop into any institution and say that this is my thing, I've been doing this, I've been doing that. No, it's not like that. Now, what we have to do, we have to alert the owners. We have to alert the owners that we are coming, we will be doing this, we will be checking this, so that they are aware of whom you really are. I would say we have moved a step from just, from just uh, protecting ourselves, but then we need to go a step higher and improve on protecting also the other members. Remember that firefighting is not a one-man show. It's a system. It's a team. And whenever we go inside a building, we so we go inside as a team. We work as a team. We come out as a team. And a good pre-incident planning survey would enable us as members or as firefighters to be able 
to assist one another in fighting a fire. And as this, by this, I would like to relate to one of the fires that occurred back then when firefighters were fighting <clears throat> a building. It was one of the buildings firefighters had gone in and they were trying very hard to put off the fire. But since the roof that was there, it was a lightweight roof and the type of building that they were fighting was a wood frame. The roof on top was so heavy. When we talk of wood frame, you may think it's just one of the boards that are underlying. No. The roof on top was so heavy that none was able to hold it for so long and be resistive. In this say, I'm talking, uh, and I'm saying that when you're talking of building construction and per se under wood frame, we may have what we refer to as a lightweight wood truss roof assembly. Because the term lightweight construction uses the truss supports or I beams, a floor or roof in this type of structure may appear sturdier than it actually is. Remember that two firefighters in Houston, that was Texas, died while battling an early morning blaze in a fast food restaurant. The fire burned through the lightweight wood truss, roof supporters, and roof mounted air conditioner dropped into the building, trapping and killing the firefighters. The fire was later determined to be arson. The roof may look simple in terms of modern, in terms of style, but once they get weak and land on us as firefighters, we may end up dead knowingly or unknowingly. We will die heroes where we were never meant to lose our life. From this point, I will come questions as we continue with our session. Five minute question session. Back to you, Jose. Wow. Before I give my comment about the awesome lesson, could you please ask questions, dear students? Um, sir Chomba, KDF, I recognize your presence, sir. Karibu sana. I see you on duty. Salute you, sir. Questions? Maybe I have a question, James, uh, sir James. Um, I was just uh, wondering, uh, I'm in the fire station and uh, I am, and uh, I was just, uh, I'm just from off duty and then I came to visit and then it happened that the fire came in. Um, do you think it will be advisable for me to enter into the fire, brig the fire engine with the firefighters to go help uh, the firefighters, the firefighters on duty to actually conduct the fire without PPE or maybe have PPE? No, that is not a recommended idea. Uh, mm -hmm. The recommended one that we usually and we say that should take place is that mm -hmm. whenever a fire occurs, there are people who had already planned for it. So mm -hmm. if you're coming in, 
make sure that you are also planned for this activity. Not that it just occurred and you felt like uh, I can be available. I can avail myself for that. And per se, you do not even have the equipment that are really needed. In that case, then you will not even be helping us. You will mm. act like a liability to us at the end of the day. Mm. Thank you, sir. Yes. So you are not supposed to respond to such a scenario. Yes, you re you, you had come, you had vis you had visited our facility. Yeah. Uh, you you may respond with us, but don't participate in any activity in that fire. And with this also responding with us may be a risky situation. And I will take you back to what happened uh, uh, back in the States. Mm -hmm. uh, you could see that very uh, there was a, a building collapse. Departments were released. They went into that uh, uh, construction that was being, uh, it was collapsing to rescue others. At the end of the day, before they could even realize, another building was hit next to just where they had already passed. So mm -hmm. imagine yourself in that scenario, you had not planned for anything, and then another building is collapsing towards where you are. Mm -hmm. And you will have just remained on the fire station. I think we'll have a card until you are recommended or until they gave you the safety properties so that you can mm. be able to respond. Let us just not respond for the sake of responding. You may be muscular. You may have the physical fitness. But fire mm. is not all about the physical fitness. It's not all about holding the horse. At times, it's about sitting back, looking into the action that really needs to take place, and at what moment do we really need to place what we need to do at that individual moment? There's a question on the chat. Uh, Hamisi Mwazige is asking, what huh? if you are told to go respond to a burning petrol station Yet you have not been provided with foam agent. How will you handle this fire? But what if? I repeat the question. What if you are told to go respond to a burning petrol station? Yet you have not been provided with foam agent. How will you handle this fire? That's a question from uh, Hamisi. Okay. Mwazige. Okay, uh, one of the cases, and I will like to recall it, yeah? it happened back then in 1977. In 1977, these were just casual workers who were siphoning fuel. It occurred that a sparkle of fire occurred and each and everyone died accidentally into that situation. So imagine us responding to a fire that is involving fuel, a petrol, a petrol station per se. In a petrol station, at the end of the day, we usually say that my safety comes first before anything else comes in into work. If you pour water onto that petrol station, we may be excavating or aggravating the fire, making it more severe, making it more tampered, all right? It becomes more stronger. Hence, we do not have anything to deal with it. In such situation, I will advise as a firefighter, if we have to respond, and it's a must for us to respond then, we respond and we do what we called defensive system. In defensive system, anything that is around that petrol station, we get to protect them. But then we let the fire station break down until, burn down until the fuel is over. Because without proper 
equipment to fight such a fire and per se it's a large fire if we try anything else apart from foam then we may be aggravating the fire instead of helping we may be causing more harm in such a case i will advise that we do defensive firefighting protecting the surrounding building the surrounding property and leaving the petrol station to burn until the fuel is over then we can be able to go in and see what was the cause or a fire investigator may come in but i do not provoke so that we stay back let us respond let us go there and see what is really burning it may be we are responding to a petrol fire station well, to a petrol station that is burning but per se into that petrol station the supermarket is the one that is burning we do not outlook that we can see that uh by now our petrol station just aside it there is a there is a supermarket beside it there is a restaurant there is a bar within it there's somewhere where people come and chill and wait for some meat to uh, some choma bite so we need to respond fast to such a fire we need to respond to such a petrol station once we arrive then we can be able to tell what is burning if it's petrol then we go back not only going back to your facility but going back to a distance that we can be able to protect all the others that are within the vicinity of that petrol station is that sufficient mr hamo Andige. Wow, that is really, is really encouraging. Do we have more questions? More questions, please. I see Mr. Mozige saying, thank you, Sir James. Okay. COVID. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> <Anderson>. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> more questions? We have uh, six more minutes before we can release uh, Mr. James. <laughs> Christabel uh, says the information is a plus to me. Christabel Adiambo from uh, Kisumu County. Thank you for joining us. Truly appreciate you. Um, More questions, please. Comment, if no questions. Do you have a comment? <laughs> Feel free. Thank you very much, everyone, for uh, joining in class. It's truly been an honor. Uh, to have you, Sir James, uh, to take us through the class. Always a pleasure when you, I was privileged for you to be one of my instructors and your class was always uh, thriving, be it in the right. field or in the class. And um, I would encourage us, these lessons that we are learning, uh, we get onto the uh, YouTube channel, Africa Fire Mission YouTube channel, and go back to them. Eh? I actually say, go and regurgitate them and listen to what Sir James said about uh, things on, in regards to a defensive uh, firefighting. What exactly does it mean? And onto your safety, you know, not being a hero. What exactly does it mean? With all that, you can actually get not only to save yourself, but also your crew, and also you'll give an opportunity for your family that you'll go back home to your family and you'll become a father, a mother, a brother, and a friend to whoever you're living with. So these lessons that we're giving is basically just for you. 
because we not only just want for this lesson to go through, we just want everybody to be safe out there because uh, heroes are, are the ones who have left us. But for us who are here, we are there to save life and property and being with our family. So I would like to uh, close the class. Uh, Mr. Jose. Yes, sir. Uh, so I would like to say, to finish with this, uh, with this, what we call the hot term. And for today, our hot term is fire load. Mm. Our hot term is fire load. And this, what do, I, what do I mean by the term fire load? Uh, the term fire load is the weight of combustibles in a fire area or on a floor in buildings and structures, including either contents or building parts or both. Anything that may be burning from the floor is different from the seat, is different from the ceiling, is different from the sides, is different from the paints. So that's where we talk of the term fire load. And the fire load is measured per feet or per meter squared. Hot term of the day, fire load. Thank you so much, Mr. Njuki. Back to you. Ooh, the lesson of today is loaded. Eh? <laughs> Smoking. <laughs> fire load. I'll actually go research more. I'm sure also Hamisi Mwazige will go and do a lot of research on that <laughs> together with everybody else in class. Oh my gosh, today's lesson has just been fire. I'm feeling so much energized and thank you so much for joining in class, everybody. I am just so grateful for the sacrifices that each and everyone is doing for yourself because this is a self a uh, sponsored event or class that you want yourself to to continue i mean to get knowledge in your mind so that when you hit the fire ground you will remember hey sir james told us x y and z and you will either back off or you will go and attack the fire with knowledge that you remembered when you're in class so i don't take anybody here for granted and I appreciate you.